Hello, everyone. My name is Vandana Pawa, and I'm the Programs Coordinator here at the Asian American Writers Workshop. Thank you so much for joining us today for another episode of AAWW Recess, which is our new series of online programming dedicated to creating a space of whimsy, play, and dreaming at a time when literature, especially for young people, is undergoing a harrowing battle against bans and erasure. I'm speaking to you today from Brooklyn, New York, which is ancestral and unceded Muncie Lenape land. A quick visual description of me. I am a South Asian woman with long dark hair and I'm wearing glasses and a black and white striped shirt. Our episode today features SK Ali, the author of the upcoming book, Love from Mecca and Medina, which is available on October 18th from Simon & Schuster. S.K. Ali is the author of Saints and Misfits, a finalist for the American Library Association's 2018 William C. Morris Award, and the winner of the APLA Honor Award and the Middle East Book Honor Award, Love from A to Z, a Today Show Read with Jenna book club selection. Both novels were named Best YA Books of the Year by various media, including Entertainment Weekly and Kirkus Reviews. She's also the author of Misfit and Love and Love from Mecca and Medina. You can find her online at sklibooks.com and follow her on Instagram at sklibooks. Thank you so much for joining us and we hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, SK. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. <gasps> Do you mind giving us a quick visual description of you? Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I'm a South Asian woman uh, wearing a pink hijab and uh, a light pink hijab and a pink sweater. And behind me is um, are some books and my part of my office. Thank you so much. Um, so we have SK here today for our episode of AAWW Recess to talk about her new book, Love from Mecca to Medina. Um, it is a gorgeous and so fun, adventurous story um, that I just finished. And, and I'm really excited to have you here to talk about this book today. Um, so I'll jump right into kind of our questions about the book. Um, so this book is a sequel and it continues the story of our two characters, Adam and Zainab, um, which began in the book, Love from A to Z, which was published a few years ago in 2019. Um, so can you take me through a little bit of Adam and Zainab's story kind of from, yeah, yeah, that's our first like, um, from your perspective, like what planted the seed for these two? Why did you begin writing them? How did you kind of come to these characters? Yeah, so um, some people say that your debut novel is the book that you needed to write. And then, you know, then there might be books that you wanted to write. So Love from A to Z, which is my second novel, was the book that I wanted to write. Um, I have this quote by Toni Morrison right by my writing table. And it's it's the one that says, if there's a book you want to see out in the world, then you know you must write it. So um, Love from A to Z is the book I wanted to see out in the world. Um, just something with hope, um, with love, you know, young marginalized characters finding love. And, uh, and the seed for it was actually planted in a museum where the manuscript referred to in the book that both of the characters based their journals on. I was actually standing in front of that manuscript and the title of the manuscript, Marvels of Creation and the Oddities of Existence, it just like, just called out to me. And I was, I just, the seeds of this, the story came of, of to me of, two people, you know, journaling their, the marvels and oddities in their lives, but they saw the world in such different ways. Mm -hmm. What would happen if they met? So the question, and it was also the, the seed was also planted at a time when there was a lot of hate online, um, just, you know, for different marginalizations and um, just seeing that manuscript made me think of all the like complexities of each other that we don't get to see when, when people reduce others into like you know ways to hate in very like just very stark ways of limiting people so um that's where I was like I want to write a book where there's just so many complexities of characters of marginalized characters brought in and still it's it's hopeful and beautiful and embraceive yeah 
Yeah, I love that you started kind of talking about the complexities of your characters because that's something else that I wanted to talk to you about is one of the things that I love most about your writing is the way you build these characters, especially as like you're kind of facing this challenge of writing against generalizations and stereotypes that are like really often out there, you know, when you're trying to write characters that are misrepresented or underrepresented like you're faced with all these stereotypes that you know everybody else is using to write these characters so i feel like your characters really speak to kind of the complexities of people and go beyond these generalizations that we're often faced with um so can you talk a little bit about the process of like building characters like a little bit more on the craft side like kind of how you really get to the the root of who they are yeah, so um, a lot of that for me starts from observations and writers are observers, right? Mm -hmm. So whenever I notice something about, you know, people that I'm around, I just tuck it away. It's like a little snapshot. And especially when, um, you know, vulnerabilities or frailties are shared either like vocally or just something you notice about the way um, somebody does something or you know, hands you something or like, it's just so subtle, but I tuck those away. And, um, and I, I use a lot of like, in terms of my writing process, I use a lot of like, uh, visualization. So I will like, um, imagine a scene, I'll draw it out. I will like, in, and in doing that, those aspects of people will start like coming out and all the things that I tucked away kind of like come out. And so then I'm able to visualize it and then I'm able to write it. So the, yeah, so I try to capture characters through their, you know, tiny actions or tiny, like little things that they might do that really reveal who they are. And um, because, you know, um, I feel like I try very much to like show the layers of people and try to knit us together by showing that, like, because so many diverse readers are, like like diverse meaning like the experiences that I capture might not be familiar mm -hmm. to so many people because just there's such a huge diverse readership but I want people to read it and be like yeah that's like so something I felt or yeah and um yeah so that's I think I really try to do that by just remembering and tucking away these little qualities that I see in people yeah, I love that. I love this idea that writers are observers first before anything. Yes. Um, so one of our characters, our main heroine, Zainab, she is one of my favorite young adult heroines. Like she's so passionate and she's intelligent and she's angry and she's sensitive, loving, fierce, vulnerable, like all of these complexities in her kind of feel so real. Um, so what it what did it mean to you to kind of create a character like Zainab in a world where like young girls, teenagers, brown girls, Muslim girls, they're really seen as like anything but all of these traits that Zainab embodies. Like kind of what hopes did you have for for the way readers could connect to her? Yeah, so um, I wrote Zainab like because I wanted to give pages and pages for um, an angry marginalized girl to like just be her angry margin you know herself right mm -hmm. and and because especially like with you know the increase of like people going taking you know going on social media expressing their you know rage and their um their feelings and emotions about what they were seeing around them and then that being met especially when it's young women expressing this you know mm -hmm. their the rage that being met with like a clamp down or like you know people being doxxed and all of this stuff you know was happening and um it's still happening but at the time I was writing I it just that just was like really like it really kind of hurt me as a mother as as well of of a young woman like to think that uh you know so, somebody couldn't express themselves and what they really wanted to say and what their thoughts of like injustice or just anything about the world uh would be clamped on on that really really like I didn't know I don't want that kind of future um so I you know that's why I wanted to give that space for Zainab to be herself and then also then grant her love like the gift of love 
at for like being the way she was and that she didn't have to change like to be loved. That is so beautiful. That is like one of my favorite things because I feel like oftentimes, like especially for these girls who are angry. Sorry, there's like a truck passing by. <laughs> especially for these girls who are like angry and vocal about it and like outspoken. Like it's almost always told that you have to lessen that. You have to be mm-hmm. smaller. You have to be quieter. Um, yeah. Especially to be able to be on the receiving end of love. So um, I love that. I thought it was so beautiful that because of not and not despite of everything she is because of those things like that love yeah and yeah and I know like for some readers like the scene what there's a scene in love for me to see where you know Adam and Zena like they butt heads and um and you know some people like get uncomfortable with that but Mm. I wanted like I wanted to show that she didn't have to change through that because you know sometimes some readers express like oh my gosh she's so mean and that you know scene Mm -hmm. and I'm like well you know there was things that Adam did not know about about her life and I didn't want to shape her to be like okay no I'll back down just to be like more likable or you know Mm -hmm. um yeah there's just like there's I wanted to show that there's reasons for the rage and it shouldn't it shouldn't like be erased you know yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so, so talking a little bit about kind of the journey that Adam and Zainab go on in this book. Um, so it takes us along their pilgrimage together to Mecca and Medina. Um, so can you talk a little bit, one, maybe for viewers who aren't familiar with that journey, um, kind of what it means, and then also like what it was like to write this spiritual journey for this couple, like what it was like for you as a writer, a Muslim writer, to kind of like bring that to the page. Yes. So um, Adam and Zainab in the sequel, Love from Mecca to Medina, um, they go on a journey because I wanted, because their st- first story was set when they were traveling and it's like, you know, uh, a meet cute that's out there. It's like a journey. Uh, I was, I wanted to continue that journey aspect um, in this book. And when I thought about where I would set it, um, I thought of Mecca and Medina because it's very, it's a central, you know, it's very central to the Muslim faith. And there aren't many books set there. Like, you know, there's like just so many um, places sacred to all the diverse traditions. Um, You know, we're talking about diverse books and, you know, wanting more diverse books. Sometimes some things are like still off the table, it seems like, you know, I don't know, just like, you know, really, really, unpacking of what that identity actually means so like if you're a Muslim Mecca and Medina is very important um so if you're going to do a special trip and a lot of young people who are able to afford it might when they first get together might go visit that place in those two places so I said okay I'm going to set the story there and I had been to Mecca I've been to Mecca like several times in my life in my life like but it was like you know when I was young and stuff like that but um in research in writing the story I had to do a lot of research again to make sure that you know things were current and it was an emotional time writing it because I you know I I revisited my memories but then also like I watched you know videos online of people you know taking um recording what their first impressions were of like first visiting the place and and also like just just there's so much online now that we can actually feel like we're there so I in in doing that research I felt like it all opened up to me again like access to all those like first feelings and stuff and uh yeah it was it was spiritual and I'm happy that I chose to set it in in that um, in those places, because I just, I feel like I, I, I brought a lot of emotion into, into it because I had those connections myself and I hope like readers of diverse backgrounds can feel, and maybe like it can ping their own experiences, visiting their own sacred spaces. And, you know, they can feel comfortable sharing that as well. 
Yeah, that's beautiful. I felt it like that when I was reading it, like the way you set up the scene, just the the peace and and kind of the joy and and that overwhelming feeling that you get when you like walk in. I, I definitely felt that come through on the page. So that's really beautiful. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about you as a writer. Um, so at AAWW, we really try to kind of like demystify what can be usually a really opaque process, which is the process of publishing. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your personal journey towards becoming a writer and eventually a best-selling author? Um, yeah, so my journey is very long, was very long and is very, I mean, in terms of like when I set out to become an author, like a writer, and then, um, but that was because of life circumstances as well. Um, you know, and, and that speaks to like how not everyone might be privileged to be able to, you know, focus on publishing um, as like a, a commitment that would take them, you know, that they could put all their financial focus on as well. So for myself, I had uh, from the time that I decided I want to be a writer, um, which was like, you know, in high school and then. I went on to study creative writing in university to get a degree in it. Um, but in the mean, you know, and, and there was a big chunk of time in between where I was working and putting, you know, bread on the table. Um, and then it was only when I, you know, refocused in 2006 and I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to revive this. Um, it took me 10 years to get published um, because I had to learn all about the industry. So a big part of if anybody out there is like, you know, wants to become published is that on, on top of writing your manuscript, you should really learn about the industry from there's so, so many, you know, helpful um, sites that can help with that. And so a lot of it was learning how to break in, and then writing my um, writing a failed manuscript, meaning I never, you know, got it, um, you know, in, in front of publishing. And then writing um, the manuscript that eventually caught the eye of uh, literary agents, and then I was able to sell it. So it's like a lot of people's journeys are like that, where it's like nothing happens for a long time, and then everything happens really quickly. But that's because for that long time, you've been putting the effort in. So um, yeah, so basically, I just went the traditional route of literary agent. Um, then you know, signing on with the publisher, traditional publisher, and um, kept continuing uh, writing because I, I felt like I think a lot of a lot of marginalized people might feel like this, and I've spoken to other authors who feel like that. Because um, when the door is kind of opened for us, you know, after the We Need Diverse Books campaign, um, social media in twenty fourteen, I think, uh, or fifteen. Um, it feels like it felt like the door is going to close the door is going to close so like i think a lot of people who debuted in the year that i did who were of marginalized backgrounds you'll see that they kept publishing like their books kept coming out because we had like i have this fear i had this fear that i was like oh, okay i got this one okay i got to get in the next one so we we really try to work hard to continue because it's very possible that the door could close you know it's very possible we feel it still to this day like I I tell people like um you know just you know we it's activism too it's not just um creativity for you know uh creatives of marginalized backgrounds we have to also be activists we have to whenever there's some an issue we've got to continue working towards keeping that door open yeah, that's such a good point. I feel like so many creators right now are like, as they're like up and coming, you're always wondering like, when is time going to run out? Like mm. people care about these stories now, but when are they going to move on to the next thing and then like stop caring? Um, yeah, well, people talk about that with the 2020, with the George Floyd, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, protests and stuff. And then, you know, publishing was like, oh, okay, we want more books. We want more books. And now like it's those books are getting published. And then we we want to make sure that fervor that the industry showed whenever something happens in the news, don't just like it's not it can't just be at those times. It has to be sustained. It has to continue. So yeah, we do have those fears, you know. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, so throughout your your journey writing, you said you you knew you wanted to be a writer in high school. Um, mm -hmm. Did you always know that you wanted to write for young people? Like what drew you towards writing for a younger audience versus for like an adult audience? Um, I think there's there's different like theories of why, you know, why a young adult started to like become really strong. And one of the theories that I ascribe subscribe to is like the fact that YA became really um, a home for women um, authors to really like be honest and you know a lot of the like really challenging books that challenged you know the status quo came come came out of YA so when I when I started to like I guess I could you could say that YA had has, has existed for a long time in terms of, like Judy Bloom and you know, some authors like that, but like, um, in terms of like, I, f I found out that when I was reading um, really strong women characters, um, they were mostly in YA. So I was like, I knew that I wanted to write like strong women and characters. And so I thought, this is where I'm seeing it. And this is where people are taking risks. Um, there's like, just more just it feels like the terrain is open in YA as opposed to like adult and now like that's changing like there's always evolutions but like in the time that I was like thinking okay I'm gonna I want to write a book YA was like a place where you could take those risks and publishers and editors were open to all these things and so that's where I and, and I love YA like I love reading it you know so yeah yeah, I love that. I, I see the same thing. And that's why I still love YA and I'm so invested in it. And I totally agree. And it's so it's so ironic to me that YA is the place where these, these boundaries are being pushed because I feel like so many times people perceive things that young people are interested in as the opposite of like boundary pushing. Yeah, no. And also like, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because young young readers are definitely more open to to like diversity right yeah. and yeah and 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 you know readers of adult are as well but it's in a different like it feels like it feels like it's a little bit more cordoned off I don't know mm -hmm. it's just something I felt you know in reading yeah, yeah. Really. um so as as an author who's kind of been in the game now with with a few books out best-selling what advice do you have for aspiring writers and authors who want to write books that are culturally relevant to them and other kids and young people who look like them, who have similar experiences to them? Um, I definitely say go for it. Um, there is, there is like, you, I, I, th I think you have to really believe that um, honest writing, and by honest writing, I mean, like, not writing, um, with limitations like being transparent um, with your story like staying as close to you know like for example culturally like cultural stories that like you don't see very much uh, staying close to them to their authenticity um, I feel like you have to believe that that's what connects other people to your work like yeah, I think, I think in, I don't know, there's, I don't know the quote, but it's like in our, in our diversity, like we find our commonness, like we also find um, those things that like, you know, that we can, we can really hold on to um, knowing that there is something that like is, you know, underneath all our diversities that like the humanity is, is very much there. And I know there's like people who, you know, like the idea of universalism is 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 sometimes can be seen as like a eurocentric view that universalism is like has to look this way to be universal but i feel like if you write very close to what you think is authentic and universal to your community um other people will will definitely like see it too and the reason I bring up other people is that while um while you know it's great to like see your audience as the like of the background that you're writing um traditional publishing 
um, is in you know North America is you know is, is going out to a pluralist society. So I still feel like it's important to to remember that when you're writing. So for example, love for Mecca and Medina, it's set in Mecca and Medina. And I try to write unapologetically in the sense that like, I'm not italicizing words. Like I'm not gonna be like, oh, here's a foreign word, italicizing. I'm not putting a glossary because all of those things other us, right? That's like, it's like saying, here's this, you know, this, this book is different from the norm. So I'm gonna highlight how it's different. And then that's like saying there's a norm, but I refuse to do all of those things. But at the same time, I'm cognizant that like, when I refer to the Kaaba, like Muslim readers are gonna be like, yeah, I have an image of that in my head. But then the readership, like I'm gonna think of the readership and honor all of my readership and its diversity and be like, okay, the, the Kaaba is like, has a black, you know, velvet cloth on it and stuff. So like just staying close to the authenticity of what you're writing, but also like, you know, inviting others in, and, and, you know, sharing it and without speaking directly to them, you know, it's like, it's like not for catering to the white lens, but, you know, understanding that there's, you're, you're, you're writing for a diverse audience. I don't know if the, like the advice was kind of like theoretical and big or, you know, um, but the other thing I want to tell you is a, a little literal, like, a, sorry, something that you can apply very literally is, um, to learn how different authors and writers, all their writing processes, to learn different ones and, and try them. Because you never know which one like speaks to you and works for you. So I always tell people to not get into like a, a rut of like just using one way of like, you know, for example, I share that I storyboard my scenes. Try that out. If even if you're not like an artist or you know, you're not into drawing doodle with stick figures you know that might be something that it'll open up something for you so that's a like practical advice I can give as well yeah that's great advice and I am very much a fan of not italicizing in yes <laughs> oh my gosh yeah <laughs> we need to end that because um, you know people always bring up like um um you know Lord of the Rings and like Jared Tolkien he never even when he did elfish lang an elvish yeah. language which is not, which is an imaginary, an imaginary language. Like he just took it for granted that people will figure it out from context or whatever. Yeah. So we can do that for living human beings, like yeah. living cultures, you know? Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Um, one last question that I always like to wrap up with because we are writers, but yes, we are also readers <laughs> at our core. Um, so I would just wanted to ask, what are you reading right now? And do you have any recommendations for viewers? Yeah. So, um, I, I recommend two books that I, um, read this year and then one book that's coming out next year. And, um, and then one book that's come, I think two books that are coming out next year. So, um, one, two books that I read this year that I absolutely loved is uh, All My Rage by Sabah Tahir and um, As Long As the Lemon Trees Grow by Zulfa Katu. Um, and then for uh, next year, there is the next, the new, sorry, I want to make sure I get the, um, the new Syrian Girl mm. by uh, Reem Shukari and um, 40 Words for Love by Aisha Saeed. So that's coming out next year. So those two are coming out next year and I definitely recommend them. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us and taking us through Adam and Zainab's journey. Um, I am so excited for this book to hit the shelves and um, please go pick it up. It's available now. So go pick it up at your favorite indie bookstore. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, SKLE, for joining us. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thanks. Thanks.